Good evening, everyone. We're about to get started. My name is Jessica Parr, and I am a professor in the History Department. Uh, welcome to Northeastern for History of the Blues. Um, before we get started, I just want to do some quick acknowledgments of the Provost Office, the CSSH Dean, the Center for Humanities, the Department of History, and the John D. O'Brien African American Institute. Uh, thank you for funding us this evening. Um, I'm going to bring out the band leader and presenter, uh, Joey Leone. We're gonna take a short break. I'll be right back in a couple of minutes. Hi, everybody. Uh, you know, if you could just turn this, the house lights up a little bit so I could see the audience. Just a little bit. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. It's perfect. Thank you, Aiden. Anyway, my name is Joey Leone, and I am going to be talking about the history of blues in America tonight. And I've done this presentation over 200 times across the country, and every night it's a little different, as it will be tonight. Uh, my background is I've been a professional musician for 47 years. Started out in my hometown of Brooklyn, New York. And how does a young Italian kid from Brooklyn find out and become an expert lecturer about the blues in America? Well, it starts off with a story about my mother. Her name was Rose. And Rosie was a great singer in her time. She went by the name Rose Lorraine, and Rosie was a singer in the big band era. And we came from very humble backgrounds. Uh, and we were living in a tenement building in the inner city of New York, and my mother was a singer and toured in a band before she succumbed to retinitis pigmentosa, which made her blind. But Rosie was a great singer, and I'd hear her singing songs like The Man I Love and Summertime and God Bless the Child. And Rosie, who was incapable of lying, she was, she was out in the brain, out the mouth type person, and she told me one day that she had auditioned for the great Glenn Miller. And... Uh, she said that she auditioned for Glenn Miller, and Glenn Miller told my mother, young lady, you're a hell of a singer, but you sound more like Ethel Waters than uh, Helen Forrest, who was a professional singer in that era. And that stayed with me. And Rosie used to listen to records by Ethel Waters, Billie Holiday, Bessie Smith, and great African-American blues and early jazz singers. So I had this little magical piece of paper it was about that big. It was called the New York City Library Card. And with that little library card, I was able to go around all around New York City, go to libraries, and I would listen and study about everything musical. But mostly, I was really attracted to the blues. For some reason, the stories and the sound of the music and the personalities of these great, great heroes of American music just got to me at a level, I was only nine years old at the time when I started to go around listening to these guys. And then the librarians in New York City started to know who I was and started to recognize me. And then they'd be like, hey, we just got this book here. Well, you might want to see this. Oh, we have this record. Some of the libraries in those days, you could actually listen to records. And they would even let you take them home. Um, so I started to listen to this blues music and really start to understand it and really, really, really start to love it at a very early age. Now. Historians tell us that the blues started in the Delta of Mississippi. That's where a lot of great African-American blues musicians came from. Uh, in the post-slavery era, in the sharecroppers, they would get together at plantations and they would hang out on the weekends and go to these plantations in places called juke joints. A juke joint is kind of like an impromptu little nightclub with hardwood floors, open ceilings and, 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 and walls, where they would dance, drink corn liquor, cuss, sin, and do a lot of other blues-oriented behaviors that were very much frowned upon in the church. Uh, and the centerpiece of this culture was the musicians. Most of them played acoustic guitars. And sometimes there would be a piano in a, in a more hoity-toity uh, juke joint. You'd have uh, pianos. But most of these musicians from the Delta uh, played acoustic guitars. Now, where did they get this music from? 
Well, here's the interesting beginning of the blues, ladies and gentlemen. And historians uh, have been talking about this. This is well studied, and these musicians are very well documented, considering there's not even pictures of some of these guys, or maybe one picture, and, but there are recordings. Now, these musicians would go to these juke joints and play for tips, play their acoustic guitars. But the blues music that they were playing, the chord forms and the melodies were the first amalgam of the African influence, working in the fields, and which you'll find this uh, pattern repeating itself over and over in history, we find that the Europeans, English, and Irish and Scottish tradesmen and sailors who came over to work in the South brought their folk music with them and their chord forms. The African-American musicians, many of them were so incredibly talented that they picked up on everything. You know, a good musician, their ears are like a sponge and they absorb everything around them. Every, so they're taking that, the, the, the influence of Africa and the rhythms of Africa and the oral history because remember, in the Jim Crow South, and especially during days of slavery, African Americans weren't even allowed to communicate with each other. So they had to communicate with each other through uh, double entendre and, and a lot of different uh, ways of communicating with each other. And much of it was through the music. And you'll hear some of that double entendre in some of the songs that I'll play tonight. Um, but this is a place of extreme, extreme sadness pain, misery, the days of slavery. Uh, these musicians were playing, many of them were playing for the slave owners and playing music, giving them fiddles and having them play classical music. There's also documentation of African-American slaves dressing up in formal clothes and playing classical music without the benefit of reading it, only because they had great ears. Now, you see this music start to develop this African influence, and then, of course, what they called the field holler. When the African Americans were working in the field, in the plantations, they would, they would work in rhythm, and they would have the guy who called, and he'd be like, get up in the morning. And then the other guys would all sing in the chorus, get up in the morning, you work to the break of day, work to the break of day. And that's how they kept going. They, they kept their spirits up. Um, as a young fella, I knew the history of the South, but the music didn't sound sad to me. A lot of people think the blues is a sad music. It never seemed sad to me. It sounded like music of great victory. It sounded like music of, of, of people in terrible situations making beautiful music out of it. Like almost like a geologist would explain how you make diamonds. You know, there's this cataclysmic event and this beautiful, pure thing happens out of it. Well, historians like myself and musicians like myself really believe that that's where the blues came from and that was the, the, the way it started to happen. These early blues musicians, people like Charlie Patton, Sun House, Willie Brown, they were all from the Delta of Mississippi and they played a place uh, in Mississippi. One of them was called, uh, it, was, it was a plantation, John Dockery's plantation, Dockery's farm. And it's been well documented that sharecroppers during the post-slavery era would get together on the weekends and listen to these guys play. And they didn't have any amplification or microphones like I have, um, so it was kind of tiring for them. So they'd have two or three of them playing in one night. Well, at that time in the country in the early 20th century, we start to see the advent of the recording business and making of records. And record companies in those days, many of them were independent labels who really specialized in niche music. So if you were an Italian American, you would hear music and buy records from local record distributors of your ethnic music. If you were a Eastern European or if you were Chinese, these records were made for you. Well, some industrious person in the record business realized that this great music that was being played on these plantations was something that could be sold to African Americans. They were making enough money that they could buy records. Well, these records start to be made in the early 1920s. And these records with, like I said, the aforementioned Charlie Patton, Sun House, Willie Brown, Mississippi, uh, John Hurt, all these people, and even up in Texas, you had somebody like Blind Lemon Jefferson. His records, 
This, these records are the blueprint of all American music. And what I will cover tonight in this program uh, is not just the blues music, but its influence on all American musics. Uh, these musicians start to sell records. Their records sell very well. And they're compensated somewhat fairly, as you can imagine. Uh, but they become big stars in their communities. Well, as fate would have it, of course, these records start to make their way out of the community. But understanding, of course, the, the culture of the Jim Crow South, you realize that these African-American records were not being distributed to white people, not played on, on any kind of radio stations in subsequent years. It was kind of a best kept secret. And these musicians were developing tremendous talent uh, on their acoustic guitars. Um, but culturally and sociologically in the South, you will find something, a dichotomy. And that dichotomy is the, between the blues, which was called the devil's music, because let's face it, a lot of the stuff that went on in the juke joint wasn't exactly uh, endorsed by those that went to church. And understand something too, that the church was a integral, if not a foundational part of what African Americans dealt with in the South. They were trying to escape terrible things and terrible conditions, and many of them, many, 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 a large majority of them found solace in the church. But the blues musicians suffered a tremendous black mark against them if they played blues because they were not part of the social order. They couldn't be trusted. You couldn't trust them around your wife or your children. They were drinking, they were using narcotics, and they were playing this sinful devil's music. Well, a lot of these early African-American musicians obviously were not well-educated, and many of them were very superstitious. And when you're a victim of being societally blackballed, a lot of these musicians fell into a, a thought pattern of, I'm doing the devil's work, I guess I have to act that way. And so there, you find a lot of these early African-American musicians uh, didn't make it very long because of their lifestyles, because they really were outcasts. And you hear it in their music, and I'll get that into that a little bit more later on. But the church and the blues operate in Southern culture in the turn of the century and early recordings in the 20s as two different things. And I will tell you a personal story. Uh, I've only had two jobs in my entire life. One of them was as a musician, and the other one, I was a board-certified dialysis technician. I worked in dialysis in Brooklyn, New York. And uh, I worked with a lot of African-American people from the, the, the West Indies. And uh, to make a little extra money, I started to take home dialysis patients. And I started to give a guy dialysis treatment at his home. And so I would work my day job, and then three days a week, I would drive to his house in Hollis, Queens, which was a hotbed of music. That's where Louis Armstrong lived. That's where Run DMC ended up coming from. Uh, Hollis Queens was a very thick cultural part of Southern African Americans who had moved out of the South to escape some of the, uh, the negative conditions there. So this guy's name was Franklin Johnson. And Franklin had this young Italian white guy coming into his home, giving him dialysis treatment. And after I got comfortable there, I asked him if it would be all right if I listened to some music while he was on the machine for five hours. And he said, sure, I guess so. And when I started playing blues, he was in shock. He was like, what? What is this? I was like, oh, that's the blues. I like the blues. You like the blues, Franklin? He goes, man, that's the music I grew up listening to. I'm from the Delta of Mississippi. I'm from Grenada, Mississippi. I said, oh, really? And then as I got to know him better and know his family better, they all knew about this great music and they all played and sang and danced and played washboards and it was incredible. And after, you know, I was his dialysis technician for three and a half years, spent three days a week at his home for three and a half years. And about two years into it, we were like brothers. And he said to me, he said, Joe, someday I'm gonna take you down to the Delta. I was like, oh, Franklin, thank you, you know? And he was a sick man on dialysis. One day, I showed up at Franklin's house, and he said, Joe, he had a piece of paper. He said, we're going to Grenada. I said, what do you mean we're going? He said, I booked dialysis treatments down there, and you're going to get paid to come down there and treat me on dialysis, 
and we're going to go down to visit my family in, Virginia, in uh, Mississippi. I was like, what? He's like, yeah. And he pulled that old Chrysler Imperial out of the barn, which had a lot of dust on it. And he said, yeah, I'm driving down. And we drove down to Mississippi. And the good Lord blessed me with two weeks of amazing culture authentically. And I don't think I would have ever gotten a, a truer education if I had went to any large educational uh, university or college. It was amazing. When I went down there, I learned a lot about African, uh, you know, uh, African American culture, food, and and some of their, you know, the etiquette involved in that culture. Um, because this was 19, early 1980s in Mississippi, a lot hadn't really changed since the 40s and 50s. We walked into a little bar, and there was a man there named Houston Stackhouse. And for my first musical selection tonight, I'm going to play you the song that he was playing there. And there's two songs I'm going to play on this instrument here. This is called a dobro, or a resophonic guitar. It's made out of brass, and it is coated with nickel. And it was originally done, played by Hawaiian musicians. But a lot of the blues guys ended up playing them because they were so loud and so boisterous. Um, and it was made, these were actually made by, uh, originally made by two Polish immigrant brothers um, who lived in the Midwest called the Dopera brothers. And they made these guitars because they didn't have access. They were metal workers. And they made guitars out of metal because that's what they knew. And that Dopera brothers, Dobro. That's how we get the name Dobro for these uh, acoustic guitars. So I'm going to play two selections here. One of them is one that represents the blues and the sinful nature of music. And the second one will be a sanctified church song that will sound very similar to you because... The musical content is exactly the same, but the lyrics, obviously, and the intent were different. The name of this first song is called Canned Heat Blues, and this was done originally by Tommy Johnson in 1927. Uh, the Canned Heat Blues talks about canned heat. Canned heat was, believe it or not, sterno. You used to use it. It was grain alcohol, and it would keep things warm. Uh, you see them sometimes in catering halls. Well, that was grain alcohol, and a lot of the poor folks down there couldn't even afford corn liquor, and they would drink canned heat. Many of them died from it, and many of them got very sick from it. But here's the Houston Stackhouse version, and I'm going to play it for you right here on my little dobro. Crying canned heat, can't eat mama. Crying canned heat, killing me. When I woke up this morning, can't heat was on my mind. Can't eat a who? Can't eat mama killing me. I said, Mama, 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 why you treat me bad? I said, Now, Mama, 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 why do you treat me bad? Prettiest little girl that I ever had. All right, guitar. so good. Stay away from that canned heat now. Don't be drinking it. All righty. So uh, I'm going to talk about the church music now. 
Now, when I was listening to these early records, one of the records that influenced me the most, and one, interestingly enough, influenced a lot of great guitar players out there, like people like Ry Cooter and David Lindley and Stefan Grossman, great guitar players, was a man named Blind Willie Johnson. Blind Willie Johnson was blind, uh, but he was an amazing guitar player. He, he played only sanctified music. He was a sanctified preacher, but his records are some of the most, if not the most important pre-war. Now we're talking pre-war, pre-World War II blues music. Uh, that's one of the, the, um, the monikers that you'll hear when you learned about the history of the blues, pre-war blues. And they were usually solo guys unaccompanied. Sometimes you'd hear jug bands, like the famous Memphis Jug Band, where they had jug band music, but a lot of it, the, the pre-war blues was solos. Well, Blind Willie Johnson's records are some of the most licensed and, and, and played records from that era, even more than, than Charlie Patton or Sun House or some of these other great Tommy Johnson, Blind Lemon Jefferson, because of his sound of his voice. His voice was almost like a throat singer. He was like, mmm, you know, almost had like that kind of sling blade kind of vibe. But I remember playing his records in my house. My mother, who was a singer, was like, boy, he's, he's got some voice, that guy. And I was like, well, my, that's Blind Willie Johnson. Blind Willie Johnson, of course, was blind, as I said. And these men are such important historical figures that they've been researched. And in the, in the time of the internet, now we're finding out things now about these guys that we didn't know. Uh, there was only one picture of Blind Willie Johnson. And it was a picture of him sitting there in a suit, looking very reet petite. And uh, he wasn't wearing any glasses. You could see his infirmity. And one of the early quotes I read in a book um, in a library in Brooklyn, they talked about Blind Willie Johnson, and he said, they asked him why he didn't wear dark glasses like Ray Charles did and Jose Feliciano and Stevie Wonder and other blind artists. And he said, if the good Lord intended me to be blind, I wasn't going to cover up my infirmity, which I thought was kind of poignant because the fact that my mother never wore dark glasses. She always uh, wore just, uh, you know, regular glasses that, that she could Blind Willie Johnson, we find out years later, wasn't born blind. He was blinded in an accident in his home and his mother and father during a domestic squabble. She took lye, which they used to use in, in, to clean things in the, in, in the South, and threw it at the father and missed him and hit him in the face with it and blinded him. So Blind Willie Johnson was blinded from the, from the 10 years old. So that's kind of like some of the tragic things that you hear about some of this music. But then again... It's victorious music, because Blind Willie Johnson went on to make spectacular records. Here's one that was covered by a lot of different people, but I'm going to give my little version of it. Blind Willie Johnson's Nobody's Fault But Mine. Nobody's fault but mine. Nobody's fault but mine. But if I don't read, my soul be lost. Nobody's fault but mine. I got a Bible in my home. I got a Bible in my home. But if I don't read, my soul be lost. Nobody's fault but mine. Nobody's fault but mine. My sister taught me how to read. My sister taught me how to read. But if I don't read, my soul be lost. Nobody's fault but mine. Nobody's fault but mine. Mama taught me how to read. My mama taught me how to read. But I don't read, my soul be lost. Nobody's fault but mine. Nobody's fault but mine. Nobody's fault. Nobody's fault. Nobody's fault but mine. But if I don't read, my soul be lost. Nobody's fault but mine. Yeah. Sanctified music from Blind Willie Johnson. Thank you. I want to play one more song on this one before I bring the band out. But I got to retune the guitar. When I retune the guitar, I'm going to tell you about the most famous Delta blues musician. I'm sure you've heard of him. Name is Robert Johnson. Not related to Blind Willie Johnson. Robert Johnson is the most celebrated Delta blues musician. His records sold incredibly well. 
and you ask people like Keith Richards or Eric Clapton or the great Peter Green from Fleetwood Mac, these great British blues musicians, uh, they would tell you that Robert Johnson really was the blueprint of a lot of British blues and, and music. Well, Robert Johnson, the story of Robert Johnson is... The story of Robert Johnson is he shows up at the aforementioned Dockery's farm in the mid-1930s. And he shows up, young skinny kid with these really long fingers, but wearing a t-shirt and tore jeans. And he asks the great Charlie Patton, who was already a superstar, um, and, and uh, Son House, who were playing there, could he come up and play a couple of songs? And they're like, sure. Robert Johnson comes up and plays and is booed off the stage immediately <laughs> and basically shown the door. And in those days, you know, you see it probably in the old movies or cartoons, and you played at a plantation, there was plenty of vegetables available for them to throw at you. So, you know, the story is that Robert Johnson got, uh, got pelted with veggies and left there embarrassed, never to be seen again, they thought. Well, Robert Johnson left, and nobody saw Robert Johnson again for three and a half years. But when Robert Johnson showed up again in 1937 at Dockery's Farm, he was the greatest singer and guitar player that anyone had ever heard. He was the greatest blues musician of his time. Now, here goes the legend of Robert Johnson. Robert Johnson sold his soul to the devil to become the greatest blues musician in the world. That was the legend. They made movies about it. Robert Johnson sold his soul to the devil to become a great musician. Well, what did Robert Johnson do for that three and a half years? Well, he probably put those 10,000 hours in that you hear about these days. Uh, I don't think he sold his soul to the devil, but that was the legend of Robert Johnson. But understanding the cultural aspect of what we talked about before, about the, the, the blackballing and, and the misery that the blues musician, Robert Johnson wrote songs about hellhounds on his trail and about how Satan was after him and he was chasing him and he was playing the devil's music and he embraced it. Robert Johnson was a sinner. He liked to drink. He liked to carouse. He, liked, he was a womanizer. And Robert Johnson, of course, is discovered by a man named John Hammond, a man who uh, was the heir to the Hammond organ uh, fortune. John Hammond discovers Robert Johnson. John Hammond's discovered many people. He discovered Bessie Smith. He discovered uh, Billie Holiday, he discovered Count Basie. Years later, in his later years, he even discovered Stevie Ray Vaughan. Uh, very important figure and impresario in music. So, so he gets him, uh, Robert Johnson a recording contract. Robert Johnson's records sell immediately. And here's where you see this archetype of the singer-songwriter, which years later went on for people like Woody Guthrie. And then years later, you know, people like Johnny Cash and Hank Williams Sr., you know, the singer-songwriter, Buddy Holly, and eventually the Beatles. Robert Johnson shows up with an attache case full of original music. Now, in the days of the blues, you got to remember that most of the musicians were borrowing songs from each other. Nobody knows where they really came from. If you see a lot of the old blues records, it says traditional arranged by when it says who wrote the song, because they really don't know who wrote the songs. Robert Johnson's songs were all original songs. Terraplane Blues, Crossroad Blues, uh, Four Until Late, all these great songs that Robert Johnson wrote. Sweet Home Chicago, which of course was made famous by Buddy Guy and Junior Wells and eventually by the Blues Brothers. Robert Johnson is, is now remember too, he, he shows up in the late 30s, which is 10 years after people like Furry Lewis and you know, Charlie Patton and Son House. So they're kind of fading out and here comes Robert Johnson. Well, Robert Johnson, of course, the legend is and there were people who witnessed this. On a night, he's playing in a, 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 a juke joint or a private party, and he was drinking corn liquor out of a mason jar, and he was messing around with a married woman. And Robert Johnson messed around with a lot of women. And that night, he messed around with a married woman whose husband was quite jealous, decided he was going to spike Robert Johnson's corn liquor with poison. And Robert Johnson was poisoned. And the story goes that Robert Johnson, from what people said, of course, living into the legend of Robert Johnson, rolled around on all fours for three days, howling like a wolf before he succumbed to his poisoning. Now, why didn't Robert Johnson seek medical help? 
nobody really knows. But in those days, African Americans uh, didn't have access to great health care. Um, they might not have had the money. And also understanding that guilty conscience. Who knows, maybe Robert Johnson in some corner of his mind felt like he deserved this fate. He dies. There's a big concert going on in New York City at Carnegie Hall promoted by John Hammond. And he goes down to find Robert Johnson to play at this it's called the Spirituals to Swing concert. You can find that on record. Uh, it's still available. The Spirituals to Swing concert where, Robert, uh, where, where John Hammond brought African Americans from all over the country playing music from spirituals to jazz, every kind of African American music. But Robert Johnson wasn't there. He was gone. And the greatest blues singer was not around. I will tell you one other quick story, and I'm probably going to go a little long tonight, so if, if, if it's okay, if you all got appointments, then too bad. Anyway, so uh, interesting story about Robert Johnson. Ry Cooter was trying to recreate the recordings of Robert Johnson by recording in the same hotel room that he recorded in with the same microphone, the same record cutting machine in the room after that, with the same acoustic guitar, the same walls, everything. They recreated the Johnson, um, Robert Johnson uh, recording in a hotel room, and he couldn't get the sound. And then he read the uh, engineer, I think his name was Spear, uh, wrote notes about the recording session. He said when he came in to check Robert Johnson's microphone, he had found that Robert Johnson had taken the microphone and put it in the corner of the room and was facing the wall with the microphone between him and the corner of the room. And the legend was that Robert Johnson turned into some kind of demon to be able to recreate this music. And many people believed that he had done this because he didn't want anyone to see the transformation that would happen to him to play this devilish music at the level that he needed to do it at. Well, interestingly enough, of course, there's a, an actually mechanical reason and a, and a rational reason why he did it. Because when you face an acoustic guitar towards a corner, these are monitors here. So it's shooting my vocal and my guitar sound up so I can hear myself. But in the days of Robert Johnson, they were one of those things. But he would sing into the corner of the room so his voice and his guitar would bounce off the wall and he could hear himself. Also, his guitar was made out of spruce, the top of which is a very uh, vibrant wood, a tone wood, and it would vibrate from the, the vibrations and the, off the wall. So that's where Robert Johnson did it. So it wasn't that he was, uh, you know, taken in by the devil. I'm going to play a little bit of Robert Johnson's music right here. And this is one of his most famous ones. This is called the Crossroad Blues. I went down to the crossroad, fell down on my knee. I went down to the crossroad. Fell down on my knees. I asked the Lord for mercy. Woo help me if you please. I went down to Rosedale, had my rider at my side. I went down to Rosedale, had my rider at my side. Nobody seemed to know me. Woo Everybody done passed me by.
Ladies and gentlemen, keep your hands going here for my band, a men, men I've traveled all around the country with on the drums, the world famous Sparky Sandler. Yeah. And my brother from another mother, Mr. Earl Irving on the bass. brings his family with him. Well, uh, so here's the interesting thing. Blues music, as we're talking about, becomes this amazing cultural experience. And all of a sudden, as you can notice, I'm playing an electric guitar now, because when the Delta blues musicians uh, left the South for a better life, they went to places like St. Louis, Detroit, and of course Chicago. Where they found in Chicago was tens of thousands of people from the South, not a couple of hundred at a juke joint, and they found electricity. So they could play their music and reach a lot more people. They weren't worried about people not hearing them. You could hear them now. So, blues music starts to take over and now country musicians are listening to blues. Blues musicians are listening to country. There, this, this magical thing starts to happen. And tonight, for the rest of the show, I'm going to document this magical thing that happened in our great country and this great American music. Well, blues music starts to influence music that's on the radio. And in 1952, a man named Smiley Lewis, now that's a good name. Smiley Lewis made a record that had a blues vibe to it. And it was covered by a lot of other musicians, and I'm sure you know some of them. You're gone away and left me long time ago. And now you're coming back and knocking on my door. I hear you knocking, but you can't come in. That I would never mess with you I hear you knocking But you can't come in I hear you knocking Go back where you been you used to be cause your love show ain't no damn good for me I hear you knocking but you can't come in I hear you knocking go back where you been Autumn you can give me a little bit more monitor for my vocal please thank you A lot of legends and double entendre you hear in the blues music, as I talked about earlier, you'll hear in this next song. And there's been a great legend in the, in the, in the culture of the South. If you were the seventh son of a seventh son, you had allegedly amazing powers of manipulation and seduction over members of the opposite camp. So um, there was great songs by uh, great Mose Allison, a, a, actually a white um, Mississippi musician. Um, but there was one also by Johnny Rivers. And uh, you remember Johnny Rivers, he had a great career. And anyway, we're gonna play, show you a little bit of where the blues starts to get into other music too. Everybody talking about the seventh son In the whole wide world there is only one But I'm the one Yeah, 
baby, I'm the one. I'm the one. The one they call the seventh son. I can tell your future, it'll come to pass. Talk real slow and make your heart beat fast. I look at the sky and I predict the rain. I'll tell if you're warm and kiss another man, cause I'm the one. Yeah, I'm the one. A little bit more vocal, please. Yeah, I'm the one. The one they call the seventh son. Seventh hour of the seventh day of the seventh week, the seventh doctor said, I'm the one. Yeah, I'm the one. I'm the one. The one they call the seventh son. Yeah, I'm the one. A little bit more. The one they call the seventh son. A little bit more. Yeah, I'm the one. Good, right there. The one they call the seventh son. Seventh son of a seventh son, baby. Yeah. Woo! Now you'll notice, uh, you can take it down a little bit now, son, the feedback a little bit. And then you'll notice that there's instrumental somewhere between where you had it and where it is right now. You'll notice, right there, you'll notice that there's instrumental parts in the, some of these songs. And there's two reasons why you'll see instrumental breaks in the middle of uh, these blues and rhythm and blues songs. One of them, is because musicians love to show off. They just love to show you everything they learned on their instrument. It's okay if you want to laugh, by the way. It's not that serious. Yeah, come on now. Jeez, I'm looking like I'm it's like an oil painting out there. <laughs> yeah, come on now. <laughs> I mean, I'm, Sparky drove all the way here from Brooklyn. I mean, come on. All right, so the other thing is that the other reason, yeah, the other reason, of course, is that um, because they would stretch the songs out because people would want to dance. And you know, you've been in social situations where a band starts playing and people don't really sure they want to get up and dance. The guy's looking at the girl, the girl's looking at the guy, is this idiot going to ask me to dance or whatever. And then finally they get up and dance and the band's, the song's almost over. So, but really in the blues though, there's also a way that the musician is expressing himself through his improvisation. And some of this goes back to that secret language of the blues. You know, when you feel bad and you're feeling down or you want to seduce the crowd, you play something and the musicians would play with each other and they would be playing off each other and improvising. And that's some of the magic of the blues, which really started to turn into other styles of music like jazz, where the improvisation became almost the entire part of the song. Um, so we're gonna play a song here done by a man named T-Bone Walker. Now T-Bone Walker was a very influential blues guitar player, who came from the South, moved out to Los Angeles, and became very influential amongst guitar players. 
But the first time many of us Caucasians heard of T-Bone Walker was on a record by the Allman Brothers called Live at the Fillmore when Greg Allman came out and said, we're going to play Stormy Monday by T-Bone Walker. is just as bad on oh, Wednesday's worse and Thursday's also sad it gets a little better though the eagle flies on Friday Saturday I go out and I play, Lord. Eagle flies on Friday. Saturday I run out and I play. Sunday morning I go to church with all the sinners. Get on my knees and I pray. And T-Bone would say this. He said, Lord, have mercy. Have mercy on poor me now. I said, Lord, have mercy. My heart's in misery. my little baby won't somebody please send that girl home to me all right guitar do your thing now
I believe down in my very soul. Do that one more time. I believe down to my soul. I think I need to do that one more time. I believe down to my very soul. I'm getting some help that I don't really need. Yeah. Thank you. Woo. Oh, man. Thank you, Earl, for helping me out there, son. Yeah. So the blues music now is taking over America. People are getting captured by the blues and it's starting to sprout out. Like the river of the blues is so powerful that the water from this river of blues is making all these tributaries. Some of these tributaries become even bigger and more powerful than the blues. One of them is called rhythm and blues. Now rhythm and blues, it has blues in the title, but it really is, it really is kind of a, a different version of the blues. It's a little bit more uptown. It's a little bit more sophisticated. And a lot of the blues, rhythm and blues singers came directly from the church. People like Wilson Pickett, who I had the pleasure of working with. Um, people like Sam and Dave. They all came from the church. And this man, who was a lead singer for a band called the Soul Stirrers, one of the greatest rhythm and blues singers did this song. It's got a little blues in it, but it's really a love song. Where the blues songs had a little bit of a harsher vibe to it, but the rhythm and blues? Sam Cook, everybody. Darling, you send me. I know that you, you send me. Send me honest you do, honest you do, honest you do. You oh you thrill me. I know you oh you thrill me. You oh you thrill me. Honest you do, honest you do, honest you do. First I thought it was infatuation. But you know it's lasted so long. Mm, I find myself now that I'm wanting to. I want to marry you. And take you home. You, you thrill me. I know that you, you thrill me. You, oh, you thrill me. Honest, you too. Honest, you too. Honest you do. It seems that the vocal in the monitor is getting louder and lower as you're adjusting it in the mains. Uh, anyway, so rhythm and blues, man. You know, it's like, it's a big thing. And you know, in my career, one of the greatest accomplishments I've had in my career was I got to play with musicians who my parents had their records. And I got to work with the great Chubby Checker, of course, who was the biggest pop star in the world before the Beatles. And Ernest Evans from Philadelphia, his name was, was a great man, treated me very well. I produced a record for him, actually, that he ended up performing at the 1990 Super Bowl um, that I produced with him and the Fat Boys, uh, who were rappers from uh, New York City that I had worked with. But, you know, the interesting thing is, is the tie-in of the blues and hip-hop music. You know, hip-hop music started in the 70s in New York City and it was a roots music. And it was a music that talked about, I mean, before it became like gangster rap and stuff like that, which you know, some of it's okay and everything, but it's really not my thing. But the great thing about hip hop at the beginning was they were talking about their experiences 
living in the South Bronx and living in Brooklyn and the Marcy Projects and places like that where there really was very harsh living. And of course, that relates directly to the blues. A lot of our African-American brothers and sisters, the only way of expressing where they were, they were calling out to the world and telling people what they were experiencing. And what came again was a whole musical genre. But you really can trace the roots of hip hop music to the roots of rhythm and blues and blues. Remembering, of course, that they used a lot of records that were their parents' records, and what were their parents listening to? Rhythm and blues and blues records. Many, many great blues musicians had their records sampled uh, by early hip hop artists. So there really is a great cultural kind of bridge between 1920s blues and early 70s and up, you know, until the hip hop era. So, but, you know, working with musicians has always been a great joy to me. And one of the cats I got to work with had a song that was really a redo of a song that was done in 1927 by Furry Lewis. His was called Stack Olay Blues. But then, of course, I got to perform it with the great Lloyd Price, and it went like this. The night was clear, and the moon was yellow, and the leaves came tumbling down. I was standing on a corner when I heard my bulldog bark. He was barking at the two men gambling in the dark. It was Staggerly and Billy, two men who had gambled late. Staggerly threw a seven, Billy swore that he threw an eight. Staggerly went home and he got his 44. I'm going to that bar room and I'm going to pay that debt I owe. Staggerly cried Billy, please don't take my life. I got three little children, a very, very sickly wife. Staggerly shot Billy. Oh, he shot that poor boy bad. The bullet went through Billy, and it broke the bartender's glass. Don't do it, Staggerly. I think you got my vocal pre post fader. I think you got my vocal post fader because when you're adjusting the mains, you're adjusting the monitors at the same time, and it shouldn't be that way. And it's almost when I sing louder, it's almost disappearing on the stage. Well, ladies and gentlemen, what happens in music? As it always happens, music starts to develop and these tributaries come out of music. And there's a young fella who was born in Tupelo, Mississippi, raised up in Memphis, Tennessee. His name was Elvis Aaron Presley. Elvis Presley, of course, is a very famous singer. Some call him the king of rock and roll. Well, the interesting thing about Elvis Presley, of course, was that he went into the Sun Recording Studio run by a man named Sam Phillips in 1954 to make a demo for his mother's birthday. You gotta make the monitors louder, I can't, I can't hear myself. So Elvis Presley goes into the Sun Recording Studio to record a demo for his mother. And Sam Phillips, a very important figure in the history of American music is there behind the board. He ran Sun Records. And it was the Memphis Recording Company there. And of course he had to make a buck, so he had to record people's demos. He hears Elvis Presley and it changes music forever. 
Now, as a historian, as a person who has taught about African-American music and, and culture of the era, we've heard some people say that Elvis Presley, you know, stole the black man's music, um, which really is very far from the truth. Elvis Presley didn't steal any music. He definitely was influenced. There's a big difference between stealing something and being influenced by it. Uh, and Elvis Presley was an important historical figure because he brought blues, rhythm and blues, gospel, country music, and choir and vocal harmony music in one package. It was the first time it had ever been done and exposed a lot of people to his, uh, his style of music, even invented rockabilly. Well, Elvis Presley, of course, was influenced by many African-American musicians. One of them was called Junior Parker, and his guitar player was a guy named Pat Hare. Very, no, nobody really knows who he is. Everybody knows who Scotty Moore is, of course, who was the the guitar player with Elvis Presley, Scotty Moore was influenced by Pat Hare, and they had a song called Mystery Train that, of course, Elvis covered. When Elvis did his first contract in Sun Records, uh, he, you gotta remember, he didn't really write his own songs, like a lot of great singers didn't write their own songs. So what'd he do? He covered other people's songs. Elvis's first hit was actually a cover of a, a, a Arthur Crudup song, big boy Arthur Crudup song, called That's All Right Mama. Well, you know, the funny thing about it is that, of course, people know that as Elvis's first record. Um, but anyway, you know, when they played blues in those days, the guitar players would play. Or, you know. But when Pat Hare started playing it, because he was listening to country music, and Scotty Moore heard him play it, it became this. That's all right, mama. That's all right with you. A flat. That's all right, mama. Any way you want to do. But that's all right. That's all right. That's all right now, mama. Any way you do. Well, I'm leaving town today. I'm leaving town for sure. And then you won't be bothered with me hanging around your door. That's all right. That's all right. That's all right now, mama. Any way you do. Scotty Moore. That's all right. That's all right. That's all right now, Mama. Any way you do. Well, that's all right now, Mama. Any way you do. Elvis Presley's That's All Right Mama. Music is, is, is such a beautiful thing. It's such a healing thing. And it's a universal language. And, you know, there's so much great music. And, of course, interestingly enough, culturally, of course, we see something happening interesting. I said earlier tonight that a lot of the early African-American musicians were influenced by Europeans that came to this country playing their folk music from England, Ireland, Scotland, places like that. Well, interestingly enough, of course, because black musicians weren't allowed to be played on white radio stations, but they were played on radio stations like Radio Free Europe. Uh, and a lot of black, American uh, white and black GIs brought records over to England and that's where you see the influence of the British musicians, the early rock and roll bands, people like the Rolling Stones. You know, the Beatles were known for writing their own material, but the Rolling Stones really played mostly blues at the beginning until eventually they started to develop the talent of to write their own songs. Um, but 
really the, the, uh, the interesting thing of that, the white British musicians making it an acceptable package to bring back to the American people to be able to listen to music that was originally done right here in our own country that they didn't want to expose to us is an interesting cultural phenomenon which we see repeated time and time again in the history of music. But, you know, the music starts to really um, turn into a lot of different things. And uh, I remember my parents had a record by a man named Louis Jordan. Louis Jordan was a great musician. And we're going to play a little bit of Louis Jordan's Caledonia. One, two, one, two, three. Swinging them drums there. Well, I'm walking with my baby. She got great big feet. She's lean and lanky, ain't had much to eat. She's my baby. And I love her just the same. It just gets lower and lower. Crazy about my baby. Caledonia is her name. Caledonia, Caledonia. What makes your big head so hard? I love you. I love you just the same. Crazy about my baby. Caledonia is her name. I went to Caledonia's house and I knocked up on the door. I what she wants said, I want some more. She said, Daddy, I love you just the same. Crazy about my girl. And Caledonia is her name. Caledonia, Caledonia. What makes your big head so hard, girl? I love you. I love you just the same. Crazy about my woman. Cat don't use her name. What makes your big head so hard? I love you. I love you just the same. I'm crazy about that girl, Caledonia is her name. Caledonia, Caledonia. What makes your big head so hard? Oh yeah, a little swing right there. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Well, we're moving on the train here, the blues train here. And uh, man, I tell you, we got a couple more stops left. And you know, I said before, country musicians listen to the blues and blues listen to country music. I got a job many years ago with a great country band in New York City and the guys in the band were very impressed that I knew how to play blues and rhythm and blues and that I wasn't a country guitar player, which was a lot of fun. Uh, music is music. You look at those pianos and it's got black keys and white keys and they all work together. And those 12 notes, That's all we got, 12 notes. But man, we can make a lot of stuff happen with them 12 notes. There was a man who played a little bit of blues in his own way. And he was a great American, great songwriter. He took the, uh, the plight of the American Indian. I remember hearing, as a guy who plays on many Indian reservations across the country, uh, the plight of the American Indian, Johnny Cash wrote a song called The Ballad of Ira Hayes, which I heard on his TV show in 1970. 
uh, talking about Ira Hayes. Ira Hayes was a Native American who was one of the men that held the flag up at Iwo Jima. But when he came back home after being a hero and was taking pictures of all over the world, he came home to the same sadness that many of our African-American brothers found and sisters found in this country. And uh, Johnny Cash documented that as long as the plight of men who were in prison and had no representation. But Johnny Cash had the blues too. And you know what the best thing about it? He went. Well, I hear the train coming. It's rolling down the bend. And I ain't seen the sunshine since I don't know when. But I'm stuck in Folsom prison. Time keeps dragging on. When that train keeps on rolling down the sand and tone. I was just a baby. My mama went and told me, son, always be a good boy. Joey never messed with guns, but I shot a man in Reno just to watch him die. And I hear the lonesome whistle, hang my head and cry. There's rich folks eating in that dining car. They're probably drinking coffee, smoking up cigars. Well, I knew I had it coming. I knew I can't be free. And people keep on moving. That's what touches me. prison and that railroad train was mine probably move it over further down the line I'm going out far from Folsom prison where I want to stay and I hear the lonesome whistle carry my blues away Well, got two more stops on the blues train. And uh, for these last two songs, could you just please make these monitors a little louder? I know I keep saying it, but I just, I'm just i having trouble hearing myself, and I don't want to sing out of tune. Like Ringo Starr did in A Little Help for My Friends. Anyway. Well, there's one stop left on the blues train, ladies and gentlemen. We went through country, rockabilly, rhythm and blues, even swing. One trip left. And they always say the the blues had a baby and they called it rock and roll. Have mercy. Have mercy. Have mercy. Hit it one time. Hit it two times. He's so good at that. Hit it three times, son. Hit it two times hard and one time soft. There you go. Just see if he's paying attention. All right, so... Ladies and gentlemen, I take this job very seriously. You know, I love my blues and I love my American music. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to play for you. The greatest rock and roll song of all time. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll say it again. I'm going to play the greatest rock and roll song of all time. I am. As Earl would say, 
The dead have risen. <laughs> yeah, so now there's been some talk over the years, what's the greatest rock and roll song of all time? And there's been some good input, but let's face it, I'm the only guy up here with a microphone and a guitar, so it's pretty much whatever I say. But it's going to be the greatest rock and roll song of all time. It was from a man who looked like a blues musician but never played the blues. He came from St. Louis. His name was Chuck Berry. Louisiana by my New Orleans Back up in the woods among the evergreens He is a log cabin of earth and wood Well, there's a country boy named John Every Good Who never, never learned to read and write so well He could play that guitar like a ring and a bell Go, go! Go, Johnny, go, 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 go, go. His guitar in a gun in his sack Sit beneath the trees by the railroad track People hear his music setting in the shade Help him play the rhythm the drivers made People passing by might stop and say Boy, that little country boy shook and played Go! Go, Johnny, go, go, go Go, Johnny, go, go, go Go, Johnny, go, go Go, Johnny, go, go, go Sandler.
hope someday he would be a man. He would play guitar in a rock and roll band. People hear his music from miles around. Help him play the music when the sun went down. Someday your name is going to be in light. Singing Johnny, be good tonight. I say go. Go, Johnny, go, go, 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 go. Johnny, be good. On the bass tonight, we have Earl Irving. Put your hands together. On the drums, Sparky Sandler. My name is Joey Leone, and I hope you enjoyed the show tonight. We had a great time being here. Thank you, all the good folks here at Northeastern, for bringing us here tonight, treating us so very well. We want to thank the good folks, the sound and the light people doing a nice job for us and also nice to us. I'll tell you something. Makes me glad I quit med school years ago, you know? Well. It feels damn good doing this. I wish life was this way. I say go. Go Johnny, go, go, 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 go. Woo Johnny, be good. Thank you so much. We were supposed to stop a little while ago, but you know what? We're going to play one more song, so don't go nowhere. We'll play one more. And you know, all right, what do you play after the greatest rock and roll song of all time, I guess? I don't know. That puts me in a great spot. Uh, you going to get a little water? All right. Let me think about it. All right. You know what? Salute. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play the first song I ever learned how to play on the guitar. And the story goes, it's 1965. Um, my parents, the Italian people, would play cards on Saturday nights. And they would play nickel and dime games. But they would be cursing and, you don't know how to, what you're doing, you don't know how to play. And the kids would usually get chased out of the... Well, I had a cousin of mine who had a really nice car. And he gave me the keys to his car. And he said, go listen to some music in the car. And it was 1965. And this song came out of the, uh, the, the, the speaker in his car. And it was a big hit record in 1965. Interestingly enough, though, it was originally a blues record by a man named Lead Belly. Lead Belly was a great blues musician, uh, did a lot of prison time. He was actually a contemporary of the great Woody Guthrie. And uh, Lead, Belly, Lead Belly was a protester. Um, did things that a lot of the African-American musicians didn't, didn't really have the nerve to do in their day. But he was a real strong human being and did some prison time in his records. He was actually discovered by a man named Alan Lomax. And you can look him up, people are interested in the blues. He wrote the book, uh, The uh, Land Where the Blues Began, which is like kind of the Bible for guys like me that started studying this music. So Lead Belly's song became a big hit record for a British band and became the first song... And I realized, too, at that point, that if I learned how to play that song, someday I could be wearing radishes the size of diamonds. <laughs> radishes the size of diamonds. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, ended up turning out okay. It's the last song for the night, and I thank you all for coming down. By the way... I have a table here with my CDs on it, which is the latest record I did a couple of years ago. You can feel free and take them if you'd like, and if there's a little thing there, if you want to throw a donation in there, that's fine, but they're really there just for the taking. Take them home and listen to some of this music that I've recreated myself. Some of it's blues music, some of it's a little jazzy. It's really some great musicians that I played with for years in uh, Killington and around places like that. Thank you. And I want you to know that uh, that for, for the folks of my, friends of mine that are here tonight that came here, you know, from Killington, the people that know me there, I just want you to know that those years, those 25 years I played in Killington were the best years of my musical life, and I owe you all a great, a great, great debt of gratitude, and I miss it very much, 
and I miss you all very much. And uh, thank you all for uh, being so kind to me for all those years. And here's the song that I was going to play for you, the last song. And good night, everybody. There is a house in New Orleans. Oh, they call her rising sun. And it's been the ruin of many a poor boy. And God, I know I'm one. Taylor and he sold my new blue jeans and my father was a gambling man down in New Orleans Mother, watch your children now Not to do what I have done Spend your life sincere in misery In the house of the rising sun A gambler needs is a suitcase and a trunk and the only time that he's satisfied is when he's on a drunk And I got one foot on a train And I'm going back to New Orleans now To wear that ball and chain
Roads now. Oh, they call the rising sun. It's been the ruin of many a poor boy. And God, I know I'm one. Oh. Good night, everybody. God bless you. The history of the blues. Help yourself some of our music. Leave a donation if you like. It's okay. Earl Irving on the bass. Sparky on the drums. Joey on the guitar. Hope to see you all again soon. God bless each and every one of you.